So uh, I'm probably going to start by talking about some uh, literal streams uh, in terms of uh, video streaming. So YouTube, uh, there's a site called Twitch TV where people stream uh, video game kind of uh, content. Um, and just to start out with, does anyone recognize who these uh, people are? A little bit, yeah. Do you, like so, the guy on the le on the um, I guess your left is uh, the most popular YouTuber in the world. He's a guy called PewDiePie, but well, it's not his real name, but that's that's what he goes by. And the other guy is a guy called Markiplier. And as you can probably tell, they're kind of like terrified at the moment when these images were were taken. Um, so PewDiePie is a man who's attracted considerable ire because he makes millions of dollars just playing video games. In particular, um, while his career has uh, considerably, considerably diversified in the past years, playing video games is still largely what he gets up to. And this guy has millions of subscribers and millions upon millions of views, uh, which translates to millions of dollars. Um, so what does it mean that so many people derive pleasure simply from watching someone else play? So in this paper, I'm interested in exploring streams of consciousness as a means to challenge concepts such as immersion and attention that are often brought to bear in understanding phenomena such as video games and virtual worlds. So the key concepts that I'll draw upon are Walter Benjamin's concepts of shock, distraction, and mimesis. Uh, it's part of a, uh, this paper is part of a larger project and um, owes quite a debt to the work of uh, Miriam Hansen, a scholar. So keeping these sort of images in mind, you can, you can tell that they're quite, you know, uh, performative. It's a very kind of like, um, you know, uh, embodied sort of thing that they do. Um, and so to begin with, out of all the, uh, the concepts that I mentioned before, the one I'm going to focus on is the theme of shock. So both of these guys made their names, basically, by playing horror games. Um, people tuned in to see them twist and contort in fear as they played these terrifying uh, computer games. And simultaneously, while watching them, they also, uh, the audience, twisted and contorted themselves in remote locations across the globe. Horror, of course, has shock as its stock in trade, but the question can arise, why didn't these audiences prefer to play these games themselves? Many of their fans uh, of these two people grow restless if uh, PewDiePie or Markiplier don't actually play a horror game, game for far too long. They write comments saying, we want to see you uh, kind of have a, have a jump scare, what they talk about as this kind of like moment that we saw before where they're clearly terrified. So YouTube has also released a television show simply called Scare PewDiePie, which you can see up there, in which they recreate the mise-en-scene of the terrifying games that he's streamed and then put him in a literal physical sense through these kinds of like mock-ups of the games that he's played. And in its recap video for 2015, YouTube included explicit references to Markiplier and other game streamers playing the horror game Five Nights at Freddy's so influential has this shock-based performative medium been on the site. So the concept of shock also speaks directly to the theme of this conference. The moment of shock precisely organizes and stages a relation between conscious and unconscious processes. Shock is a time-critical appearance to consciousness. Shock is a key notion in Benjamin's thinking about media, as reflected in his enduring concerns with Baudelaire, caricature, data, and so on. It is a theme which he uses to explore the, uh, ideas of embodied and tactile response to media. Its role in his famous artwork essay is well known and indeed has been recruited for the study of video games in the work of Ian Bogost. So I will only briefly go over the outlines of it here goes something like this. In an urbanizing environment increasingly characterizes, characterized by shocks, technically reproducible media such as film represent these shocks through the technique of montage. Moving from shock to shock or from montage to montage, audiences recognize their new world and the new minute bodily movements 
they must master in, uh, in the form of these represented shocks. So this attitude to film demands a playful, distracted, tactile mode of engagement, as opposed to the attentive one characteristic of what he calls erratic works of art. So film audiences are able to make their self-alienation highly productive and thus comport themselves to socially necessary tasks. Just how and why this transformation takes place, however, is somewhat opaque in the final Frankfurt School approved version of the artwork essay, vetted as it was to remove what Adorno charged was Benjamin's undialectical ontology of the body. Miriam Hansen argues that what is at stake in Benjamin's uh, argument becomes apparent in a synoptic view of the artwork essay across its entire development. So all the different versions that she's, uh, she's retrieved and put together, what she calls the urtext of the essay. In this view, the, fam the familiar binary opposition between singular erratic artwork and multiplicity of technical images becomes more complicated. Because in previous versions of the text, the, re the relation is historicized by terms such as innovation, mimesis, and the optical unconscious. So innovation refers to what Hansen calls a non-destructive mimetic incorporation of the world. For Benjamin, innovation takes place in relation to what he terms the mimetic faculty, where in the final version of the artwork essay, play and tactile apprehension of the, mass of the masses are formally distinct from aura, semblance, and individual contemplation. In other texts, Benjamin adumbrates a, com a common origin, mimesis. He says, the, cat the category of play figures as an aesthetic alternative to shine or semblance, in particular, the concept of beautiful semblance. Uh, this is a concept that finds its fullest elaboration in Hegel and German idealism. In the fragment, The Significance of Beautiful Semblance, Benjamin writes that in this view, beauty is semblance, the sensu sensuous appearance of an idea or the sensuous appearance of the true. Uh, contemporary, in his day, contemporary versions of erratic experience, uh, the dead-end aestheticism of phantasmagoria and the cinematic star si system were a sats remnants of a once glorious thought, but no less dangerous politically for that. So what was obscured in the focus on semblance in this discourse on art, but what is now clearly brought to, brought to light is the concept of play. Semblance and play form an aesthetic polarity. This is quoting from uh, Benjamin. This polarity must have a place in any definition of art. Art is a perfecting mimesis. In mimesis, tightly enfolded like cotyledons, slumber two aspects of art, semblance and play. So mimesis for Benjamin is neither a slavish reproduction of an object of sense, nor the sensuous appearance of an idea, because it involves a performative transformation in the body of the mime, uh, him or herself. He writes, the oldest form of imitation had only a single material to work with, the body of the mime himself. Dance and lang language, gestures of body and lips are the earliest manifestations of mimesis. So the mime uh, no, not only invokes something that is absent, as in conventional modes of signification, but also plays his subject. So Benjamin, takes this historical distinction between semblance and play and makes it a conception of uh, modernity and technological media. Uh, and he does this by distinguishing between the first technology and the second technology. Where the first technology source ri sought ritualistically to control an overwhelmingly powerful natural world by, and this is a quote, making the maximum possible use of human beings, uh, exemplified by human sacrifice, the second te technology involves the human being as little as possible and cum culminates in the remote-controlled aircraft which needs no human crew. Hansen writes that where a contemporary reader might associate the second technology with the latest in American-style electronic warfare, drones, crews, and cruise missiles, Benjamin, Benjamin makes an amazing turn towards what he calls the multiple playful and wholly provisional procedures of the second technology. Um, this historically conditions the artwork essay's account of exhibition value and also entails a shift in telos, or goal. 
The first technology really sought to master nature, whereas the second aims rather at an interplay between nature and humanity. So this results in the historical appearance of a vastly expanded technological room for play. As mimesis shifts from semblance towards playful, um, a more playful kind of like pole, it's the, uh, is the cipher and correlate of an un unconscious ruse, he calls it an unconscious rules, ruse that affects a pro progressive abandonment of the enchantments of ritual and semblance, the belief that a single decisive performance or apparatus can secure a total mastery of nature. The unconscious, unconscious relinquishing of this goal implies the advent of new forms of contingency that were structurally disavowed in the magical gestures of the first technology. New possibilities of performative failure, something like what Wendy Chun has called new ways of going astray. In this respect, the historical shift between the first and second technologies corresponds to the account of the aura's decay in the artwork essay. Here too, a singular relation, the unique duration encoded in the work's history, gives way to a plenitude of technical, technically reproducible operations and perspectives. So for Hansen, Benjamin's gamble with cinema then is to wager that if the medic faculty is to remain capable of innovation, of a non-destructive incorporation of the world, in so destructive and frightening an environment as a modern city, its playful aspect would necessarily eclipse that of semblance and find its basis in the second technologies once is as good as never, rather than the once and for all of the first. Film's importance is not to record nature, but to take up this interplay between human this interplay between humanity and nature and represent it, thus making self-alienation highly productive. She writes, the prismatic work of film involves a double structure of technological mediation. It refracts a world that is already shaped by heteronymous structures, heteronymous structures that have become second nature to us. The processes that generate, and this is obviously Charlie Chaplin, and he's one of the major examples that Benjamin kind of uses. So the processes that generate heteronymous structures and then innovate them through playful mimesis occur themselves at heterogeneous levels, from fragmented individual to dispersed collective. It is thus the transformations that he adduces in the mimetic faculty that underwrite Benjamin's analysis of mass media at the levels of society and species. Slapstick, slapstick comedy and animation provide metamorphic figures who, through eccentric comportment and caricature like, or, and, man, and mannerism, uh, take up the character like aesthetics to redeploy them at new scales and temporalities, affecting what Esther, Esther Leslie calls a cosmos of detonated physics. The grim and mimetic humor of Chaplin and Mickey Mouse arrives to help innovate the heteronymous structures uh, of the world as an optical unconscious, at once embodying modern, modernity's uneven, uneven developments and radically challenging anthropocentric hierarchies. So the point here is not to adjudicate whether Benjamin's gamble with play and cinema in the artwork essay came off. Um, Freud and Adorno, for example, who both see play as infantilizing, have important countervailing perspectives to offer. Um, it is Important to recognize, however, that Benjamin himself elaborated similar concerns in essays such as The Storyteller about the bungled reception of technology and shared with other intellectuals a disappointment in Disney's gradual move towards naturalism and psychologism. By the same token, uh, gaming also has significant political, uh, regressive political cultures and aesthetics. However, if Hansen is right in her reconstruction of the overall text of the artwork essay, Benjamin's overall concern is not to valorize an aesthetics of play over that of semblance, but to render an account of the dynamic valencies of the mimetic faculty. Um, so play is not a royal road to answering the demands that art makes of the present, but an ongoing process of opening a future. A gamble always implies the chance of failure, but for Benjamin, this moment of accelerated danger and the catas catastrophic inadequacy of the attempts to realize uh, the utopian potentials of technology highlight the importance of play. As Hansen put it, puts it, the child reaching for the moon falls short, but nevertheless learns how to grasp. So there's probably like, there's two ways of thinking about the ramifications of this, uh, this sort of dialectic in 
um, the contemporary situation that we started with, which is these people watching on YouTube the shock experience of um, people online. So first of all, it's worth noting how different this approach is from the typical rhetorics of immersion that are common in discussing virtual worlds. Ideas such as, as immersion are in fact the very opposite of what we would argue from Benjamin's position, a clear which is, you know, because it's a clear case of absorption that he attributes to the erratic kind of work. Instead, the gaming situation can be construed not as a separate world into which we enter, but as something much closer to how its creators view it, as a set of techniques, graphics, sound, music, artificial intelligence, character and level designs, interface, and so on, that often work well together and often not so well. Um, these heteronymous structures, as Hansen puts it, influence the ways that players' tactile capacities are refocused and redeployed in video gaming, as hinted in common terms such as twitch reflexes, action, actions per minute, and hand-eye coordination. This is not immersion, but innovation. By the same token, token, the time-critical nature of the concept of shock, which names the moment in which, something, in which something appears to consciousness, prevents us from theoretically deciding on the cognitive, or in this case, ludic value of any of these streams of consciousness ahead of time. Engaging in playful innovation, the navigators of virtual worlds move from shock to shock in a state of distracted habituation. This can help explain gaming's perennial preoccupations with elite athletes, high-performance vehicles, wizards, space marines, and so on. Figures particularly good for modeling and creating shock. Furthermore, as noted, the notion of shock acknowledges the moment at which, in which streams of consciousness become conscious, a theoretical stance that will be increasingly important as the set of bodies and powers involved in gaming increases in what Florian Kramer has called a post-digital post -digital situation of distributed computing. At a collective level, the concept of mimetic habituation needs to be historicized further from uh, Benjamin's time and his key example of cinematic, cinematic montage. After all, the intensities and qualities of shock have changed considerably since his time, and gaming is a key locus in which this becomes visible, as well as the fact that the shower scene in Psycho seems kind of tame nowadays. Shock itself has uh, taken on very different valencies. So if we now return to fans who desire to watch PewDiePie be terrified and the way that horror games have bedeviled the careers of these streaming stars, it's possible to rethink what those fans recognize and respond to in those performances. What is at work here is not, or not only, a cute guy uh, or any particular game. Uh, none of these streamers tend to be very good at video games and that's why they get shocked a lot because they're terrible and this is why die-hard gamers don't tend to like them very much so the people who do support them and do watch them and do like them tend to be not avid gamers at all so in the spe specificity of the practice um, of the fans of these people then we can read the cipher of a mimetic faculty that has shifted even further from its once unassailable basis in semblance towards the polarity of play as these distracted masses shrink and twist and scream along with their chosen streams of consciousness and unconsciousness, they are, more, uh, the, they are more than a networked public. They are also truly an eclectic body. Seeking to make their own self-alienation productive in this way, viewers engage in processes of innovation adequate to their own set of shocks and their new socially necessary tasks, or what we could term a massively multiplayer mimesis. Thank you.